Hey everybody, KMO here. I already lit the incense. Wasn't thinking. Anyway, today I am going to address a comment that I received on the second of yesterday's videos. Yesterday I did a second video in which I was talking about, it was called uh, Automation is No Big Deal. And it was, you know, a deceptive title or a joke title and that I'm saying, look, Automation is just the beginning of the process. Automation is where machine intelligence is taking over tasks that humans used to do. You know, those tasks have been automated. But what's really going to throw us for a loop, what we're really not prepared for, are the capabilities of AI set to novel purposes. Basically, AI doing things that we didn't anticipate because they are things that humans could never have done. You know, right now, I think largely what AI is doing, it is replacing, um, you know, routine cognitive labor, but it's also taking the place of enormous bureaucracies. Like Google knows a hell of a lot more about you and me than the Stasi knew about people living in East Germany during the Cold War. There's just so much more capacity for collating data, for collecting data, you know, for basically just making sense of huge mountains of data that in the past, even teams of humans, you know, well-funded, well-organized, nationally backed teams of, you know, intelligence analysts, they couldn't do it. They're, they just couldn't, they couldn't do what AI can do now or machine learning can do now. And that process is just going to continue, which is going to create problems for us. This is something that a lot of peak oil doomers can't hear. It's like they have some mental dysfunction. I say, look, there are certain technological trends that are in evidence right now. I'm not talking about the future. I'm saying this is what's on the ground happening right now. And as this progress moves forward into the future, you know, progress not in the, the normative sense of, you know, I mean, we progress to something better, just we progress in a particular direction. We go further down the line that we're already on, and we are going to encounter difficulties that we are not prepared to deal with, that our current models of the world, the current stories that we use to navigate the world, the current narratives that we use to make sense of what's happening to us have not prepared us to deal with this situation in an adaptive fashion. This is not utopianism I'm talking about here. I'm not saying we are headed to some glorious future where everything is perfect, you know, that machines provide everything for us. I'm saying we are using machines in a way now that is causing trouble for us in the present, and we are not responding to it adaptively. And if we continue to fail to respond to the challenges of the moment in an adaptive fashion, we are going to suffer even greater societal disruption. Is this utopian thinking? I mean, this is what I was talking about in yesterday's video, to which humanity responds, civilization will likely collapse long before your Star Trek future ever comes into being. Keep up your farming skills. <sighs> what video did you watch, humanity? I get this from peak oil doomers a lot. I, I look at technological trends that they hate. They don't want to think about. They think, you know, the whole society is going to collapse tomorrow or next year or the year after next. And we're never going to have to address these issues because they're just going to go away on their own. No, they're not. They're not. They're not going away on their own. You will have to think about it. And dude, I know a lot of farmers. I know a lot of farmers. They are not in any position to survive should industrial civilization collapse. They all drive trucks. You know, the ones who are working a lot of, a lot of land have tractors. They all buy food at the store. And most of them depend on the income from a spouse who works off the farm to keep the whole operation going. Farming skills will not see you through a civilizational collapse. They just won't. And if you insist that that is the future that's coming, that no other future is a possibility and is worth preparing for or even thinking about, you know, as Thaddeus Golas, the author of The Lazy Man's Guide to Enlightenment, says, 
If you refuse to admit that cars exist, you're going to get hit by cars. Not because you're evil, not because you're wrong, just because you're not looking out for them. So that's, that's the way it goes. Now, let's just talk a minute about Star Trek future, because this is a, a popular term of abuse in the peak oil doomer community. If you are not down with sudden, systemic, irreversible collapse in the near term, then you are smoking hopium and you are addicted to a Star Trek future. Well, what does the Star Trek future look like? There's no money in Star Trek. They make a big deal out of the fact that they long ago set aside the acquisition of material resources and status as a motivation for humans. In fact, Earth and the core of the Federation is so peaceful that it's damned boring. We never get any stories set there because, you know, nobody has to struggle to make a living. Nobody is oppressed. Nobody is making other people poor by hoarding all the resources for themselves. You know, to get to any conflict, you have to get in a starship and go out to the, you know, the periphery. Go out to where the barbarians are still using money and making war on one another and, and making a big deal of race and gender. And, you know, Star Trek is a utopian society. What have I ever said? What have I ever, ever said that makes you think that I see us, I see industrial civilization and early 21st century Earth moving in the direction of a classless, moneyless, post-scarcity society. But the Doomer, you know, something inside, it just, you know, things don't connect. They can't hear. They can't conceive that there is any possible future other than total systemic collapse in the short term or utopian post-scarcity, glorious communism. And I'm saying, you know, either one of those things are conceivable. They could happen, but they're both extremely unlikely, particularly in the short term. And in the short term, today, right now, information technology, machine learning, the proliferation of mobile computing and cheap sensors and cameras all over the place are making it harder and harder to maintain certain fictions that we have lived by for centuries. Fictions like, you know, the idea that there is an ongoing individual self that has some sort of free will, which is not subject to influence or causation. You know, these as we learn more about neuroscience, as we learn more about the brain, as we learn more about what really motivates human behavior and not the just-so stories we've been telling ourselves for a few thousand years now, we are coming into unfamiliar territory, territory where to chart the best possible course, we are going to have to abandon old ways of thinking. We are going to have to entertain new conceptual models which won't be comfortable for us. And if you can't even distinguish between, if you can't even acknowledge that there is a huge spectrum of possibility between total immediate systemic collapse and total post-scarcity, total equality utopia, if there's nothing in between that you can, you can conceptualize, forget farming, man. <laughs> I mean, forget farming. You don't have the necessary cognitive fluidity to deal with, you know, a natural environment that an actual farmer has to deal with. You know, farmers have to think pragmatically. Farmers have to think about money. Farmers have to think about inputs and outputs. They have to think systemically to survive, you know, and they're not surviving. Farming is, you know, particularly family farming, particularly small scale family farming. Yes, we have these heroic figures that we look to, but in terms of the percentage of the population which is engaged in that sort of activity, it continues to dwindle and you know, when you're a farmer or when you go to live on a commune or when you drop out, you still have obligations that industrial society places on you. And it is extremely difficult to meet those obligations if you don't avail yourself of modern technology, of fossil fuels, of electricity. And let me tell you, if you're watching my videos and then commenting on them and saying that, you know, civilization is going to collapse before your Star Trek vision comes into existence... I don't believe that you're out there working a small-scale farm. I don't believe that you're an accomplished hunter-gatherer. I don't believe that you know how to make buckskin or that you know how to, you know, dress a carcass. I, I don't believe that you are 
you know, dressing chickens and, and pulling guts out of them and slaughtering animals, you know, on your small scale farm. I think you're probably just wallowing in nihilism on the internet, which is useless. Now, granted, humanity, I don't know you, or if we've met, you know, your handle doesn't tell me who you are. But based on my decade plus in the peak oil community, I've met a lot of people who say the things, say things very similar to what you're saying. And I understand that their cognitive faculties have been degraded by the doomer mentality and the narratives that appeal to it. It's a brain rot. It is, metaphorically, a sickness. And hey, I'm going to do something that I almost never do. In fact, this might be the first time in six months of doing these daily videos. I, uh, I actually hit stop, <laughs> you know, and I took the phone. I left the studio, which is to say this corner of the living room, and I went over to the easy chair or, you know, the recliner where I do the editing, and I put the video together, and then I thought, no, I'm going to go back and shoot some more. So what more do I want to talk about? Well, let's, let's go back to Star Trek. Again, I get this a lot from peak oil doomers. If you're not down with immediate, systemic, irrecoverable, you know, <laughs> once and for all collapse in the short term, in the very near horizon, then you are embracing some pie-in-the-sky Star Trek future. Well, what, what is a Star Trek future? As I said before, you know, there's no money, there's no oppression, the, the class difficulties have gone away, you know, racial frictions have gone away. Uh, there's nothing to indicate that we're going in that direction, not at any significant speed, not that, you know, it's going to take us to a place that is recognizably Star Trek in that dimension, not in my lifetime. But technologically... What's going on in a Star Trek future? They have faster than light space travel. They have artificial gravity. They have anti-gravity. They have matter transmission. They can disassemble a living organism, can, you know, convert it into information, beam it hundreds, thousands of miles to a different location, and reassemble it such that it is still alive and the brain has all the memories and the sense of personal continuity that it would have had if they, you know, the person had just walked across the street for a cup of coffee. That's Clark tech. That is basically magic. That is godlike technology. If humans had access to technology like that, I think our civilization would be completely unrecognizable. Also, in Star Trek, from the original series, you know, from the 1960s series, there is information technology. They have computers, but the computers are in the background. The computers are not making decisions. Humans are making decisions. And one of the, the slippery slopes that I see with information technology is that as machine-rendered decisions yield consistently better results than decisions made by humans, we are going to cede responsibility to the machines to the point where, really, humans are not particularly interesting when it comes to determining, you know, the direction of human civilization. That really, it is the decisions and the needs and the priorities and the agendas of machine intelligence which dictate the direction of the civilization, something which has not happened in Star Trek. In Star Trek The Next Generation, we have data, but through a plot contrivance, there aren't an army of data. There isn't, you know, a Starfleet full of androids-like data. He's unique because he was invented by a single, lone, you know, solitary genius that nobody, no team of people, no country, you know, no, no planetary civilization could replicate the work of Nunian Sung. He was so brilliant. Well, that's absurd. Information technology... That the, at the level that we have now was not created by a single person. Information technology that manifests itself in something like the form of commander data of an android walking around, taking in information, having relationships, making sense of the world, and holding aspirations for his own development. I mean, by the time that comes about, it certainly will not be the work of an individual. That will be the work of generations of scientists and engineers and artists and actors and therapists and all manner of people pouring their talents and their energy, you know, and their time and their effort into this project of creating, you know, whatever comes next, whatever 
life form or entity or agency takes the baton from humanity and runs with it faster and further than humans ever could. You know, by the time that comes around, nothing like a Star Trek future where, you know, people walk around and they have jobs and they worry about their relationships and they worry about their careers. That stuff will all be so atavistic, so far in the rearview mirror that, you know, there's there's no chance of a Star Trek future coming about because Star Trek future is a incongruous mix of the priorities that we have in the present mixed with technologies that will be so transformative that our current viewpoints, our current social structures will just be obliterated. So a Star Trek future, as it's been depicted on TV, is ridiculous. But it's a great frame for exploring philosophical problems, which you know I think is why a lot of people are attracted to it. Even people who don't have any overt interest in philosophy, they get drawn into the ethical dilemmas presented to characters in Star Trek. Now, I'm not talking about Star Trek Discovery. I'm talking about good Star Trek, you know, 20th century Star Trek and the Star Trek of the early, early 21st century, you know, the 90s and the aughts. I'm not talking about Discovery. I'm not talking about J.J. Abrams, you know, Fast and the Furious, explosion-filled, pew-pew Star Trek. I'm talking about real Star Trek. Okay, I could talk about Star Trek forever because, as I've made no secret of, I love me some Star Trek. Anyway, I will talk to you again tomorrow.